So I thought I would just give you guys kind of an overview of kind of how I approach um, being a museum director, um, which kind of starts with this idea that, um, you know, art can be anything. You know, art doesn't have to be a picture framed on the wall. It can be anything. And in fact, the language um, and culture of art, uh, the, the kind of language of art, has been very much kind of taken on by um, other forms of media. And we've seen that in a number of different ways. And I love this William Burroughs quote because, um, because in fact, the people who lead oftentimes the change in society are the artists, are the people, the creative people who are kind of thinking in new ways, envisioning new realities, imagining different power structures. And I think this is like a central motivation for me as an art worker, um, as I kind of imagine my work in the world. Um, and so some of the ways that this happens is through um, you know, the, the mainstream media. And in, in many circumstances, the, the media has actually kind of co-opted this imagination of change um, and completely decided to change reality. So, you know, most of us recognize that global warming is a real thing, but sometimes Fox News decides that it's not. Um, or, you know, things like this happen and you're like, wow, is that really news? You know, like this is something we need to be talking about urgently. Like there's so many other really <laughs> urgent things to talk about. So just to say that, you know, the, the kind of, the, the cultural, um, the, the, the kind of imagination of art has like leached into, uh, its power has leached into the way that the media expresses itself, which is to me a really interesting thing. Um, and not only that, but you know, sort of more mainstream art publications like Art Forum, which you know have traditionally been the space of, um, you know, really kind of more academic discussions of art, um, have also turned to kind of contending with the daily realities of people's lives at times. Um, so I find this to be a really interesting phenomenon where you have kind of the mainstream media inventing new realities and the art media reflecting <laughs> realities, which is sort of a strange condition. Um, and so my interest is in talking and thinking about artists and collectives and other makers who may not define themselves exactly as artists, um, as people who can actually make change in the world. Um, you know, I think there's a lot, I mean, especially like after the results of last week's election, we can all imagine some improvements that can be made to our society in really profound ways. And, um, you know, and I think that there are a lot of people feeling kind of unsafe right now. So, you know, I, I, I'm very hopeful that art and culture can play a big role in kind of helping us to envision a space where, and, and ways to kind of contend with that. So um, there's an artist named Jeremy Deller who said, I went from being an artist who makes things to being an artist who makes things happen. And I think this is kind of like the rallying call in some ways for many younger artists who are kind of breaking down outside and going outside of the realm of galleries and museums and kind of working in a space um, that is interactive, that's participatory, that makes meaning and culture in a slightly different way than, um, than perhaps in the past. And this is a project called uh, It Is What It Is that was um, done in 2009. And what Deller did is he took this, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a burned out car. And um, basically that, that car was from the street in Baghdad where, where it was bombed by somebody. Um, and, um, and he took it and he put it on the back of this, um, this trailer and he drove it around the United States. And on board the trailer were uh, an Iraqi war vet, uh, an American soldier, and an Iraqi citizen who lived in Baghdad at the time. And he was there too. And they stopped in like public plazas and just random places across the US and parked this burned out car and talked about the war. And they talked about the war with everybody. Um, and it was kind of like all comers were welcome. It was about having a conversation about what the war meant with an Iraqi war vet, a US soldier, and somebody who lived, an, an Iraqi who lived 
in Baghdad. And there were kind of brilliant, amazing conversations that came out of this that made people sort of see the war in a slightly different way. Because, like, you know, we're sitting all the way over here in New York or wherever, and, you know, the bombs are falling someplace else. So this helped us, it helped the people who interacted with Jeremy and with the two um, vets. Uh, you know, help them understand something totally and see something totally different. Um, then um, in 2011, when Tahrir Square happened um, and, um, you know, monumental Arab Spring moment, um, this collective emerged um, in Tahrir Square that actually threw up a video screen and started showing films that were made by people on the ground. It wasn't like outside media because people weren't seeing their own selves reflected. And so they wanted to see, <coughs> so, so they were like, look, we don't want the Western media or anybody else to be taking our picture and telling our story. We want to do that ourselves. So they set up this screen and sort of started going out interviewing people using their phones. And it was just like really simple. And then they would paste it up online and just, it was this flow, this constant flow of, of imagery that was made by the people who were in Tahrir Square experiencing this very intense moment in their political history. Um, this is one of my favorite projects that came out of Occupy, which is um, called the Rolling Jubilee. And the idea is to cancel people's debt. So in the same way that like, okay, so during the financial crisis, people, the reason it happened in part was because there were these brokers buying up debt and then consolidating and consolidating it into the riskiest, riskiest bunch of bundles of debt. And then, <coughs> so, so what, and they were buying those and reselling them, right, for higher and higher prices. And then, anyway, so I'm not going to get into that whole thing. But what the idea here was to say, okay, what if we raised money and bought people's debt and then just forgave it? Just said, you know what, you don't have to pay it back. Um, because what they could, what they realized they could do from what they were doing during the financial crisis that made, precipitated it, um, was that they were bundling the debt together and then they were selling it. And so if you could buy that debt, why couldn't you just forgive it? Because you were buying it for cents on the dollar. So suddenly the debt that you had that was $25,000, somebody could buy that for like five bucks. And then they could say, you know what, you don't know what to me. So that's what they, that they, they've been doing this for years now. You can go to this website, it's totally amazing. They've raised several million dollars and they've canceled many millions more of actual debt. Um, and so what they did is they decided to focus on healthcare debt at the first kind of realm. And then they decided to do it by zip code to see what would happen if you, to a community of people who all had their debt canceled, their healthcare debt. So anyway, some really interesting cultural strategies to resist kind of uh, larger pressures. Um, women on Waves is an extraordinary organization that provides women's health care off of international borders in the water so that women could receive health care and, and abortions in places where um, it wasn't legal. Um, and then, so just to talk about me a little bit, <laughs> I worked at Creative Time before going to the Queen's Museum and um, I, I started this department called the Global Initiatives um, where we had sort of three main projects. The first was Creative Time Reports, which was envisioned as, you know, if, if I think about um, great art changing the way that we see the world, uh, whether that's, you know, a, a, a very beautiful painting or an installation of some kind that just, you know, makes me sit back in awe, you know, and not, not everything needs to be political um, necessarily. Um, but um, so anyway, I, I, I really felt that, you know, there was an interesting space, there is an interesting space for art to play in kind of this larger vocabulary of, um, of uh, storytelling, right? Because artists tell stories at the end of the day. And, um, and so there was a condition in the media, there is a condition in the media where, um, you know, a lot of times now with, you know, kind of the consolidation of media um, and just very few big companies controlling most of our media sources, um, there were fewer and fewer kind of correspondents on the ground who were living where they were reporting from. And so the idea behind this project was to say, okay, artists have important things to say, artists of all kinds, whether they be musicians or you know, visual artists or poets, whatever. And they're living in the places that they're, you know, that, that, that they're talking about. And so they, they have something to say and they can say it in a different way than somebody who maybe flies in for a couple of days and kind of you know, gets the gist of what's going on and decides to, to break a story. So the idea was let's make a network of artists all over the world in every corner um, who you know, wants to talk about what's going on 
in their universe. And so, anyway, this, w you know, we did this, um, we did a couple of really um, kind of interesting pieces. Um, the, um, the key was not only to actually connect with the artists, but also to connect with more mainstream media and make them aware of the importance of artists' voices in their own platforms. So that way we could get to a much larger audience than whoever would be interested in going to our URL because, you know, whatever, we, weren't, we were just never going to reach that big an audience. So, um, so we, we partnered with outlets like The Guardian and the New York Review of Books and Foreign Affairs Magazine. I mean, just like a whole slew. I, have, I think I have a slide. Uh, but we did projects with this amazing um, writer in, in, in Kenya, um, um, Munir al Qadir in Kuwait. Um, and, and sometimes they were written things, and this was a video. Um, and you can check all of these out. These are still, these are all there. Creative Time Reports keeps going. <laughs> Um, this David Byrne piece was about gentrification in New York City and, you know, kind of how he thought New York was changing. And, um, and this was on the front page of the Guardian website for four days straight. And it was like, at the time, one of the most popular pieces ever. They, kept get, they were getting like a bajillion hits. So our strategy was like, let's get a David Byrne up there because people know who he is. And then, you know, and then we can give them whoever you know, then they're going to be psyched to get whoever because they're like, oh yeah, that was cool. Let's do that again. So that's exactly what happened. We went with David Byrne kind of first with the Guardian, and then, you know, we could give them, you know, people who who you know nobody had heard of, but were saying really important things. We also did this really interesting one with um, Trevor Paglin, who's a fascinating photographer who does all of these projects where he photographs kind of um, kind of places that either like. S technically don't exist <laughs> or, um, you know, like black sites and, um, and, and kind of surveillance spaces. And so what he did is he, we got, we worked really hard to get permission for him to fly a helicopter over the NSA and the other U.S. surveillance um, agencies. What's really interesting when you see the photographs, and, and you can again check these out on our website, is, uh, is that they, um, the parking lots are enormous. And the buildings don't look that big. And you're just kind of like, hmm. And you realize that these buildings must go like stories underground because they're only like three or four stories above ground. They don't look that big. And the parking lots are like huge multi-story things. <laughs> anyway, totally fascinating. We made these images. The, the thing that motivated Trevor was that he was like, OK, so this was when Edward Snowden's revelations came out and like everybody was printing articles about the NSA. And, um, and domestic spying and da da da. And basically, they had one picture of the NSA that was like from 1974 or something like that. And so Trevor was like, let's expose this. Like, these buildings are there. This is, the NSA exists, and let's do that. So we made these images free. Uh, anybody could use them. And so instead of this old image from 1974 that was like provided by the NSA, all of these articles then that were coming out started using these images when they were talking about the NSA or the, um, or the CIA or any of the other surveillance agencies, of which there are like many more than we commonly think about. Uh, oh, this is one of the images. So you can see the parking lot is like enormous, enormous. These are, that's the parking lot. <laughs> Crazy. Um, so we partnered with all of these different um, uh, outlets. These were the, these were where people were tuning in from. And this is the, these are where we were, where the artists were that we worked with. Um, the other thing is a summit, um, the Creative Time Summit, which is an annual conference on art and politics. Um, and we get, we used to, we gathered at NYU every year for a number of years, and then uh, brought it internationally. Uh, so we had a convenience stock coming in Venice. Um, it was always about really bringing artists together who were doing really radical work, and then sort of sharing a meal together, sharing strategies, because most of the people on the stage, uh, in the audience, could have just as easily been on the stage. So it's an like, amazing kind of group of people. Um, we had a prize that we gave out to really outstanding artists. Um, and you can go check out the talks. They're all like 10, minute lo ten, mi ten minutes long. Um, they may be by now sorted by content, so that might have eventually happened. <laughs> but anyway, the, the conferences are really quite amazing. Um, and then there was a global residency program where we kind of sent artists out into the world to kind of think about new projects in places that they wanted to explore. And um, now I'm at the Queen's Museum, um, <laughs> which is a really interesting institution because um, 
you know, the Queen's Museum has, uh, for the last 10 years, had the community organizers on its staff. And it's a very public museum that's in Flushing Meadows Corona Park, kind of right next to um, where the US Open is played and um, um, in just a really interesting neighborhood of Corona. And, <coughs> Um, and, and so we've been deeply embedded in the Corona neighborhood, but you know, what's, what's super fascinating about being the Queens Museum is that we're in this borough that is, like liter that is literally one of the most diverse places on the planet. There are over 165 languages in Queens, maybe some of you live there. Um, but you know, it's, it's a place where anything that's like hyper-local in Queens is inherently international because everybody is like Skyping or WhatsApping or whatever with family and friends who live halfway around the world. So, you know, to me this is a really interesting context in which to think about, you know, these kinds of ideas about change and the kind of things that are affecting us most as a society, whether it's, you know, super local to Queens or in fact, you know, connected to stuff that's happening halfway around the world. Um, and one of the cool things about the Queens Museum is that in about two and a half years we're going to be the first art museum in the country to have a public library branch inside the museum. So the Queens Museum will actually have a Queens Library branch. And Queens Museum worked with the libraries for about 12 years doing kind of programming for recent immigrants together and, and other things that happen both at the museum and in the libraries. But this is like a 2.0 on that because we're going to get to do all kinds of amazing things. And you know, one of the, the things that I love about the Queens Museum is that we have this like very big open space at the center of the museum. And, um, and that was done very much um, very much intentionally to kind of create a commons in the center of the museum because I think also as um, public spaces are becoming increasingly privatized across the city, you know, we have an opportunity to actually provide a commons, to provide a public space where people can get together and kind of use it for their own uh, purposes. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be for just a museum event. Um, so we also host a lot of community events at the museum, whether it's the community advisory board for the Flushing Meadows Corona Park Alliance. We have a community partnership gallery where we um, have exhibitions of, you know, um, local organizations um, who are, you know, contributing to the, the cultural landscape of New York City in very different ways. Sometimes they're advocacy groups, sometimes they're um, sometimes they're like arts, smaller arts organizations. Um, but we really take advantage of having this like very large open space at the center to, to really do some interesting programming there. Um, so this is the space I'm talking about. It's quite dramatic. Um, and this was a project by uh, a Mexican artist named Pedro Reyes. And Pedro um, made, designed this project called the People's United Nations because in fact, the history of the Queens Museum is that it was in 1939, the building was built as the New York City Pavilion for the first World's Fair that was held in New York. And then from 1946 to 1950, the actual United Nations met there while it was being built, while the buildings were being built in Manhattan. Um, and, then, um, and then the building became the site of the 64 Fair, um, and then in 72 became the museum. Um, so Pedro was fascinated by this United Nations history, and so he decided to have a People's UN. Um, at the Queen's Museum, and so basically he, um, well, he and the museum collaborated to find people of every, from every nation represented in the UN in New York, and then had a People's United Nations, had a convening of those folks, and they discussed and kind of made action plans over the course of a couple of weekends um, about um, the issues that the UN was contending with during that same period. So very different outcomes, interesting, the conversation, the way the conversations happens um, and the people's UN as opposed <coughs> to the kind of professional UN in Manhattan. Um, and so anyway, the, the, just beyond this wall is probably the, the most, the thing that the Queens Museum is well, well known for probably is the, the panorama of New York City, which is a scale model of um, all of all the five boroughs of New York City. Um, it was made for the 1964 fair. There are 854 some odd thousand buildings on it, tiny little buildings made out of wood. Um, and Robert Moses commissioned this to kind of show off the bridges and tunnels that he built all over New York City during his many decades um, um, in, in um, controlling all of the the infrastructure in New York. Um, 
And what I love about the panorama is not just that it's a cool thing, because it is a very cool thing. Like I try to walk through it every day when I'm at the museum, because it's just, it's really a fun object and little planes land and take off from LaGuardia, it's super cute. Um, but it's also a tool. It's, a, you know, th what, what's amazing about the, the panorama is that it's a tool to see the city in new ways. So like, for example, right after the, the financial crisis in 2008, this is, I mean, I've only been at the museum for a year and a half, so I don't take credit for this, but this artist named Dave Damon Rich, who's an artist and urban planner, he was like, oh, I can, you know, I can show what's really happening. Like, even if you didn't, so he, so he took these, you know that when you order in pizza and there's like a little plastic triangle to like not let the box hit the cheese? He spray painted like a whole bunch of those hot pink and he put them on all of the, um, the buildings that were in floor closure in the city. And so even if you didn't know what a credit default swap was or you know, didn't understand the intricacy of like why this financial crisis was happening, you could just look at that thing and be like, oh, right, these are the people being affected. And guess what? I know exactly where they live and where they don't live. <laughs> so you know, this was a way of materializing something that was super abstract. And I think this is something that artists are also really good at, is like taking something that's like, Oh my God, the credit default, so I don't even know what this means. Like, what does this mean in my life? Like, what does this mean in reality? It just sounds like something made up and it just makes it real. It distills it into something that you can see, you can touch, you can understand. Um, so right now at the museum, we have this amazing show um, of work by Meryl Laterman Eucles, who's a fascinating artist. Um, who um, wrote something she called the Maintenance Art Manifesto in 1969. She had um, graduated from art school and always been encouraged to be an artist, and she got married and had a kid. And all of a sudden, all she was doing was like washing clothes and feeding kids and dressing them and, you know, whatever, maintaining. And so she was like, look, if Marcel Duchamp tells me that anything can be art, why can't maintenance be art? And so she decides that maintenance and care, and she's really pissed off, by the way. She's not just like, oh yeah, maintenance is art, that's cool. Um, she's like really pissed. And it's the middle of the financial crisis in New York, the, the one that happened in the 70s. And she re recognizes that you know all of the sanitation workers are kind of being treated terribly. They're being blamed for all this stuff that not their fault and they're just trying to you know keep the city clean and healthy um, they are not enough workers the city's like practically bankrupt and so she decides to go and be the artist in residence at the Department of Sanitation she's unpaid she works there for four decades she's still an artist in residence at the Department of Sanitation and her first project is that she goes out and she shakes the hand of every single sanitation worker during each of their shifts. It takes her 11 months to do it because she's got to go all over the city like a million times to catch every shift. And she says to each of them, thank you for keeping New York City alive. And you know, she's in that moment expressing her own kind of respect for those workers, but also saying, you know, we're alike. You know, I do this too. I'm a, you know, underappreciated maintenance worker. And, you know, maybe we can imagine what we do in some way as being art. And so she continues to do that. In any case, the show is a retrospective of all of her work, um, which she's done over many years. And there are some very mo moving projects. I encourage you all to come out. And um, you know, if you say that you're with St. Francis College, you get them for free. So um, we also have like loads of public programs. This is from our summer film screening series, where we call Passport Thursdays, where we focus on a different global region um, each week and have a film and some either like a performance or music or whatever from that region as well. We have lots and lots of kids programs. Our education department is probably the biggest department at the museum and we have week of free weekend workshops. We do a lot of work um, just in making. Um, this area of the museum is actually um, there are artist studios at the museum so we're not just a place where we present art but there's also art made there. Um, and there's the panorama. And that is right outside our front door, which is the, the, the amazing Unisphere, which has become a symbol of Queens in so many ways. And then I just want to talk really quickly about, and then you guys can ask me like anything you want. Um, but um, Tanya Bergera is a really amazing Cuban artist who's lived in the United States for some time. And, um, and she um, did a star initiated a project that's still ongoing at the Queens Museum. She initiated it about six years ago. And it's called Immigrant Movement International Corona. And uh, I love this quote from her. And so 
basically the idea was to kind of start a movement that would place immigrants at the center of, um, of change making. And, um, and so we started this little storefront, like not at the museum very purposefully, like in a storefront on Roosevelt Avenue, like in the middle of the center of Corona. And, and basically gathered folks who, you know, we knew were interested in kind of um, do it, getting involved in a slightly radical art and political project. And so, um, so the idea was that this place would be set up for workshops for people to get, you know, advice on how to deal with their legal status. Um, you know, there were lawyers there who came in for shifts. They were, um, you could get certified to do construction work. You could also take a Zumba class. Like, you could also uh, take a class. And, and everything was all offered multilingually. Um, and, um, and it was, a very vibrant location because people started knowing it. And I think had the Queens Museum not had community organizers in the neighborhood for uh, probably uh, six or seven years before that, we probably wouldn't have had the trust of the particularly undocu un undocumented folks who were in the neighborhood. But having, ha having that platform enabled us to kind of make um, this transition. Also, Tanya lived upstairs, so it was kind of this amazing thing where she was like really, like literally in residence. Um, and you know, and then it was clear, you know, Tanya decided like there were other things that she needed to do in the world, and we really wanted to keep the project going. And so we worked out a way, and so did the people who had gotten really involved in it. And so it developed into this kind of popular education model for political engagement as well. Um, and that was really Tanya's aim from the beginning. And so um, the the Consejo, the council that that kind of formed to kind of guide the um, the work of the of Emi from um, from when Tanya lived there so she kind of moved out and kind of we purpose we very intentionally like phased her out of the, the process but the Consejo now is meeting and doing strategic planning together and they're kind of um, they're defining the direction of this uh, of this space and so they pick each year kind of a set of priorities that they're working on and so last year they were really working around um, Black Brown solidarity issues um, uh, in concert with Black Lives Matter, and uh, this year they're working. Um, I mean, they're still continuing that work, but their focus is on educational justice and bilingual justice in the public schools, the eleven public schools in Corona. So that was a like speedy, speedy thing um, with a lot of ideas in it. So maybe I can just open it up now to you guys for questions. She said, I touched on issues of gentrification and, you know, as Queens becomes more gentrified and given the fact that we're committed to these kinds of um, social justice issues, how, how do we contend with that? How do we think about it? I mean, I don't think anybody's cracked the nut on that one yet. Um, I mean, it's something we're really actively <laughs> kind of trying to figure out. Um, this is not an easy question because gentrification is, um, it's structural, right? It's like when, the, especially like gentrification happens when the city makes zoning changes and suddenly things shift a little bit. Now Queens has some built-in things that are super interesting actually to think about vis-a-vis -vis gentrification and the way it can or maybe will be a little bit delayed. So we have like a millisecond more to t of time to think about it. But like, so two things that are super interesting about Queens. So the housing stock is like really different from Brooklyn's generally Brooklyn's housing stock. It's always been like super working class, and so the housing stock isn't nearly like as attractive as like you know if you walked into you know <coughs> parts of Crown Heights or Bed Stuy you know 15 years ago like you couldn't imagine it as easily. Um, and then there's also the immigrant piece is really interesting because um, mm. rents are a little bit higher in kind of immigrant neighborhoods. Uh, because people will pay a little bit more to live where their people are. So, you know, like recent Colombian immigrants will pay a little bit more to live in the Colombian parts of Queens. So there's, a, it's just, there's, there's some interesting dynamics. I don't know how that's going to play out in the long term, but we're certainly thinking about it and we're involved with a lot of like on the ground groups who are kind of contending with that. It used to be that there was something called a public artist 
like way long, like in the 70s, you know, people did public art or they did gallery art. And I think those distinctions are really not, they're very blurred. They're just not as useful anymore because people are making, and, and the artists that I'm most interested in right now are dealing with much broader publics. Um, you know, not just to say, like I'm putting a sculpture in a traffic triangle. That's not to me. That's not like public art. Public art to me is more about engagement. I mean, it could be if there's other elements to it. But just to say, like, just putting something out there is not um, to me a significant enough engagement with the public, whoever that is. Um, and I think that you have to kind of define when you're talking about public art. You have to kind of define your audiences and who you're most trying to interact with. Um, you know, just as an example, when I was at, I was at Creative Time when we did the Carol Walker project, which was an extraordinary sculpture, and she had never made a sculpture before, um, and it was inside the Domino Sugar Factory. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have an image of that, but it's pretty dramatic. You can Google that on um, and check out the. Um, but there was an incredible conversation that happened about that, actually it, about gentrification, uh, because the Domino Sugar Factory, of course, is now being converted into condos. And I think that, you know, on a profound level, the artists who are kind of talking about the real world stuff, the stuff that we can all relate to, it's not, you know, about some, you know, insider art conversation. Like the Meryl Eucley show that we have up at the Queens Museum right now, I mean, she's worked in public space, she's worked, you know, we have her social mirror, which is this, this incredible, mirrored garbage truck that literally you're reflected in it, right? So like, I mean, you can barely see the thing. It's super weird. But it's at the Queen's Museum on Saturdays and Sundays. So if you come by on the weekends, you'll, you can check it out. But it's this amazing, it's a real garbage truck covered in mirrors. And so our trash is who we are. It's just stuff that, you know, today we decide we want this, tomorrow we don't want it. It suddenly becomes trash. It's then abject, right? And so the social mirror reflects us the gar garbage is like a, a portrait of us in some ways. And so, you know, if that's the kind of, I mean, that's not something that is like an elite conversation. That's really like very basic about who we are and what we put in the trash can and what that means in the world. So the panorama was made, as I said, in 1964, and it's all, it's made out of wood. It took like three years for this fabricator in Connecticut to make it for the fair. Um, the the panorama itself was updated in 1992. So the panorama you see today is mostly 1992 New York. There are a couple of things that have been updated. For a while, the museum was kind of using it as a fundraising opportunity. And so, uh, you know, like when Yankees, the new Yankee Stadium or City Field were built, you know, somebody made a donation to the museum to have like a new Yankee Stadium and City Field on the map. Um, and like Brooklyn Bridge Park, for example, that was actually built on the panorama before it was built in real life. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Um, but anyway, the, um, uh, you know, my feeling about it is that, look, you know, in the age of like 3D printing, like you wouldn't make that model with little wooden blocks and hand painting them. So, you know, at a certain point, it's going to become kind of like a weird retrograde thing to do to update things on the panorama with little wooden blocks. Um, and I almost think, like, wouldn't it be cool right now if it was the 1964 panorama and you could see what New York City was in 1964? Because, like, we kind of know what it looks like now. So my feeling is we kind of stop updating it. And even though it's a little bit of a mishmash and whatever, like, for example, the Twin Towers are still on it. Um, uh, so, you know, like, that's interesting and kind of weird. Um, but I kind of like that. It's, you know, cities change so much that some, some, in some ways, like keeping this record of who we are, who we were at a particular moment in time and what the city's landscape literally looked like at a particular, particular point of time is interesting. Um, and um, yeah, and like I said, we're doing tons of projects with it, um, you know, trying to kind of use it as a, as a tool, as a planning tool, as a visualization tool. I think what we try to do is like, you know, f frame things in a way where it encourages conversation rather than is totally didactic. You know, it's, I mean, you know, people sometimes say to me, like, how can you be so political? Like, you know, isn't a museum supposed to be a neutral place? And my response is, museums have never been neutral. It's always been about the dominant culture. That's, that's a position, right? It's not, um, like, I'm trying to undo that. 
you know, <laughs> I'm trying to say, look, museum's neutrality is totally biased. It's not real, you know. Connoisseurship has always been about judgment and saying like, oh, my values are the most important, so this is what I'm going to pick. You know, so, so my point being that, you know, we need to kind of upset the apple cart sometimes in order to have the conversations that are really important so that people can kind of get outside of their worldview and see somebody else's. I think that's really important, especially, <coughs> especially right now. Um, and I think artists are really good at doing that. So, you know, the, w the way we try to present things is with a lot of support around it. So for example, our VEAs, our visitor experience agents, who are the people who are standing in the galleries, um, because of the kind of intense diversity of our audiences, because most of the people who come see the Queens Museum stuff are from Queens, um, we select the VEAs to be multilingual and to be able to speak in many different languages. And so like they're there to support, and they're trained by the education department to support an inquiry-based kind of interaction with visitors. So it's really an effort to kind of say, okay, like if this is confusing or upsetting to you, like let's talk about it. So it's, um, it's not meant to be like confrontational in the sense of like, you know, get with the program, but more like, okay, like let's have a conversation about this, you know, and let's let's make this space a space that we can actually, you know, do that. That it's not, you know, it's not negative, and it's not it's not bad to have negative feelings either. Like, you know, you can have that and and still make it a productive space. Does that kind of answer? Our work is so big, it's so structural, we have so many different things to kind of contend with. Um, and, you know, there are certainly cla issues of class and race and xenophobia that are embedded in everything that we're dealing with today. Um, you know, I, I, listen, you know, I can't see the future, but I know that you know, we got a lot of work to do. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the Queen's Museum is going to keep hammering away at those issues and, you know, kind of reflecting um, what we see as kind of the ways that we can tackle social justice through culture. You know, we work with a lot of local community organizations all over Queen's. It's not just, you know, we work profoundly in Corona because that's where we are, but we also are deeply connected to lots of folks who are working across the borough. But look, we have a viewpoint, you know, and, you know, we have some goals and it's about equity and justice. And, you know, I, I, I just I f think that's really important. I don't I don't feel like I have to be apologetic about that in the face of what's happened. So, you know, well, I'm sure. Yeah, I think we certainly are. I mean, we're certainly an advocate for immigrant justice. I think we're certainly an advocate for I mean, I don't know who would disagree with that, like patently, but I mean, that's a harder thing to say today than it was maybe a week ago. But just, just to say, you know, you know what I mean. It's not. Um, um, yeah, it's not. It's not going to be easy, but it's definitely needed. You know, and sometimes I joke. We're we're one of the few bathrooms in the park in <laughs> our part of the park. <laughs> So I say, you know, come on in, use the bathroom, and maybe stay for the art. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I mean, I think this is like a really critical question, like what makes you public? And, you know, on one level, you know, I do feel like because our bi building is owned by the city, like there is a responsibility that I feel to be like more open and more, you know, welcoming. But I also just feel that it's important for museums to be public spaces. So, you know, I, I'm working to figure that out, and I know it's not common, so it's not common. It's a, it's a little bit of a luxury to be in Queens because we're we're also like, you know, we can do some weird stuff and experiment because we're not like under that spotlight of like the New York City art world, and so we can do some weird stuff, and people also know they have to pay attention to us because we do do that weird stuff. So I think it's important to like do real, but also do weird. Thank you so much. <laughs>